Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to uh, uh, begin because the countdown clock has already begun and we're losing time. So a couple of quick uh, things to say first. Number one, a lot of people have uh, been upset that they've had to choose between panels in our two-track policy. These cameras that you see are here for a purpose. We are recording all of the sessions in both rooms. And in the fall, when everything is edited, every session will be available on the kenpresents.org website. So if you care, you won't miss anything. <clears throat> Number two, I just want to say, and this is a point of personal privilege as um, consigliere of Ken Presents, uh, and as a devotee of uh, Pluto, for those of you who were here, um, I believe, Constantine, that um, the demotion of Pluto, the murder of Pluto, was yet another Putin disinformation campaign. <laughs> and that you were sent to effect it. <laughs> I deny it. I deny it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, third thing before we really begin, as I said this morning in the aperitifs, uh, we're really lucky to have uh, Jay Johnson and David Sanger with us. And David has written this really quite fabulous book, The Perfect Weapon, which is about cyber war. Uh, it is for sale outside, or, and except for that one. <laughs> and um, he'll be around to sign them. But uh, the point is that it is the best one-stop shopping uh, exercise about this issue. <clears throat> and it is incredibly readable. It is not full of techno jargon. It reads like his writing for the New York Times. So I really do urge you to buy it. You will learn an awful lot. So, and we have Jay, who was Secretary of Homeland Security in the second Obama administration, basically uh, charged, among other things, with defending against the country against cyber attacks. So let's begin. Um, it seems to me as a layman that we're at war. It's uh, a term that uh, John Bolton used before he became National Security Advisor. Michael Hayden, the former director of the Central Intelligence Agency and the National Security Agency, has described the um, attacks on the United States election systems in 2016 as the most successful covert operation in history. But as David points out and really details very well in his book, the election hacking is only of a piece with other efforts, similar efforts in covert uh, cyber operations directed at us and at other nations by actors beyond Russia, Iran and North Korea to be specific <clears throat> and non-state actors. So I thought it would be best to begin uh, by having David describe the landscape a little bit and explain how pervasive this is, <clears throat> how scared we should be, and we'll go from there. Uh, well, thanks. Well, it's great to be back here with you, Michael. It's really great to be here with, with Jay. We had a lot of interesting moments back and forth when Jay was uh, still in government. We'll talk about a little bit of those um, on the record. later on. On the record. On the record. On the record. On the record sure. moments, okay. that's right. Um, but um, <clears throat> I'm not sure that I would necessarily say, and I'd be interested to hear what Jay has to say on this, that we are at war at this moment. We are at a level of just short of war, constant cyber conflict. And there's a difference because one of the things that makes cyber so useful to so many states, particularly when used against the United States, the world's most connected society, or one of the world's most connected societies, is that it's a way for states to begin to undermine other countries, to influence other countries, to um, affect their internal politics, or disable mm -hmm. some of their key equipment without stepping into that gray zone that's likely to lead to a military action. 
And when you think of all of the cyber attacks that the United States has been through, and a few that the United States has launched, one of the things they have in common is that none of them so far, fortunately, has resulted in a escalation to a traditional military conflict. But isn't that the point? And that is the point. And that's why I'm not sure it's a war. Because um, countries have become aware that one of the things that makes this so much more useful than nuclear weapons or so many conventional weapons is that you can dial it up and you can dial it down. And it has so many different forms. So um, we're all sitting here now thinking about election influence, something that the two of us discussed a fair bit at the, at the time at, in the summer of, and fall of 2016. But before that, there were Russian attacks on the State Department, the White House, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and before that on the Defense Department CIPRANET back in 2008, 2009, uh, which is the main sort of classified communication system. And in each of those cases, the US government and the Obama administration made a decision not to go call out the Russians and not to make them pay a significant price. And one of the arguments of the book is that those decisions, while perfectly understandable in the moment in which they were made, for all sorts of reasons that, that we'll discuss with Jay, I think over time led Putin to believe, well, if they're not going to defend the White House, the State Department, and the Joint Chiefs against what at the time we thought was simply espionage, something all countries do to each other, why would they go and defend the Democratic National Committee, which is essentially staffed by college mm. kids? But that's only one form of cyber attack. So there are attacks that are about espionage. There are attacks about data manipulation. We haven't seen a whole lot of those have a major effect yet, but you could imagine in the future changing the blood types of everybody who's listed in military medical databases. You could imagine the chaos that can be caused by just changing where financial transfers happen. And the North Koreans have been really good so far at stealing some money from uh, central banks. The Bangladeshi <clears throat> Central Bank, it got 86 million dollars out of. They were trying for a billion, but they made a big spelling mistake in the transfer <laughs> changes. They wrote foundation as foundation, and somebody at the New York Fed caught, it's what your mother always said, always proofread. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, there's data manipulation. There's a tax on infrastructure. And of course, we're all concerned about the electric grid but it was the American and Israeli attack on the uh, Iranian nuclear uh, plant at Natanz that resulted in actual physical effects. And one of the arguments of the book is that that operation, which we all know as Stuxnet, because that's what people called the, the virus that got out and it was codenamed uh, Olympic Games. Um, at the time that that happened, 2008, 2009, 2010, it was the early days of the Obama administration, it was hard to find another sophisticated state against state cyber attack. When I went to work on the perfect weapon and we started trying to total up the fairly sophisticated attacks that we had seen, not just denial of service, but something sophisticated, <clears throat> we stopped counting somewhere between 200 and 250. And that was just in the past six years, and just the ones we know about. You can imagine how many we never hear about. There are now probably between 30 and 40 states that are capable of launching sophisticated attacks. And of course, we worry every time we pick up the paper and read that the Russians or someone else has put code into the utility grid, as the Department of Homeland Security announced publicly in uh, this spring that they had found, and then later expanded that to say it was in the control rooms. But while we get upset about that, we don't know what the intent of that code is. Yeah, but just, just let me ask again the layman's question. It would seem to me from your description that bad stuff, malware actually, has been put in various places, Yep, lurking there, sitting there, waiting for someone to pull the switch or pull, push the button. 
right? Or to make it clear to us that they can get into any of our systems and could push that button, which then raises the question, would you want to have a global norm, and we can debate this later on, that yeah. says we won't put malware in each other's election systems or in each other's electrical grid or in hospitals or emergency communication systems. I suspect if we tried to set that rule and get out to go negotiate it, we'd probably have a fair number of the intelligence agencies come out and say, well, before we rush off to that, we too put malware right. into foreign systems. Well, and, and as, you, as you describe what we did to the Iranian nuclear program. Right. Um, and a bigger program called Nitro Zeus that I describe in there, which was if we had gone to war with Iran, fortunately we did not, because right. of the 2015 nuclear deal, which I hear has run into some trouble. Um, <laughs> but, but had we, we had a plan to be able to try to unplug right. them without ever firing. So it's really, it's, as you say, a question of perspective. I That's mean, right. when it's done to us, oh my God, when we do it, it's a prudential yeah. short of war step to level preparing the Preparing the field. battlefield. Yeah. Preparing the battlefield, perfect. Um, Okay, so let's, let's just skip to Jay for a second, not only because he's been taking notes, but because... It um, always worries me. It when does. Jay's taking notes and I'm talking about... And we're not worries. taking notes, right. <laughs> when the subject's taking notes instead of the journalist. Um, how do you react to this? And, 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 and take us through the thinking that uh, David alluded to of the administration when it came time in that famous moment in October, I guess, of 2016. October 7th, 2016, okay. at 3.30 p.m. I remember yes. that afternoon, yeah. Right, right. So a this lot was going a, on that day. A big time, so. folks. <clears throat> the point that they'll make in about a second is that we quickly became distracted by something called the Access Hollywood tape. Yeah. But a few minutes before that, Jay Johnson, among others, put out a very serious warning about what the Russians were up to in hacking the election. So just take us through that. So um, <clears throat> a couple things. One, in April, I was called before the- Of 2016. Of 2018. Oh, okay. I was called before the House Armed Services Committee to testify. If I wasn't sick enough with doing it 26 times in three years in office, they called me back for a third time as a private citizen. And the question on the table is, you still have Does your security they, clearance? Uh, <laughs> yes, and I won't say any more than that. <laughs> okay. um, does a cyber attack constitute an act of war? Can a cyber attack constitute an act of war? The basic answer is maybe. And the best legal scholarship out there on the subject that I can find says Notwithstanding the means, it depends upon the effects. So whether it's a kinetic means, like a missile strike, if there is a physical effect of a destructive nature on infrastructure, on human lives, if it's a cyber attack that causes the destruction of a building or it causes the loss of human lives, that, depending upon how big it is, can constitute an act of war. There are a lot of people whose first impulse is to say, well, isn't, cyber, isn't what's going on right now warfare? I, I believe we need a new word for it because, and David alluded to this, the United States itself has tremendous capabilities, defensive and offensive, in cyberspace. And our friends and our enemies, if we come up with the definition, would be entitled to say, well, if it's good enough for the U.S., it's good enough for me. And what's good for you is good for me. Mm -hmm. And so we need to be careful not to reach for a very aggressive definition of what constitutes an act of war in cyberspace that might be used against us. So October 2016, um, I, I, for three years as secretary, I read the daily presidential daily brief and a host of other intel, uh, which was almost as good as David Sanger's sources. <laughs> and um, we saw, and sometimes it's difficult to sort out between what you see in intelligence and what you see in the New York Times and the Washington Post, we saw a rising 
we had a rising level of concern about hacks on the DNC. And there came a point in time by late summer 2016 when we knew it was the Russian government at the personal behest of Vladimir Putin that was behind the attacks on the DNC. Uh, and we, we knew how we knew it. And our entire intelligence community was convinced of this, various degrees of certainty, but were convinced of it. And the discussion then became what to do about it. I and others, and ultimately the president, believed that whatever we do, we've got to tell the American public what we know. And it would be inexcusable if we did not tell the American public what we knew at the time about what the Russians were doing to put their thumb on the scale of our democracy during an ongoing election season. This is 10 days before the election. It's no, October well, a month, 7th. about a month. We, we, the yeah, the debate month began in late summer, okay. went through September. Um, in case no one has noticed, the Obama administration does not just wake up one morning and issue a tweet. Uh, you know, we think about these things carefully. And there were a host of considerations. You guys are so old school. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> there, were, there were a host of considerations going on. And inevitably, when you make a difficult national security decision, uh, somebody's going to say, why did you do that? And somebody's going to say, why didn't you do it sooner? Why didn't you do it sooner? Um, and in retrospect, people will ask, why didn't you do it sooner? Or why didn't you do it louder? Or why didn't the president do it? Uh, but I remember very clearly what we were wrestling with at the time. One, any time you declassify evidence, there are serious considerations of sources and methods, and what is the effect of compromising sources and methods and declassifying what you know. Uh, number two, uh, we were in the midst of a very, very contentious election season in which one of the candidates, Mr. Trump, was saying it was gonna be rigged. Uh, I, my, my working assumption is that he thought he was going to lose, and it was going to be rigged. And there was a school of thought around the table in the Situation Room that simply by making attribution, <clears throat> we are undermining our own democracy and playing into Mr. Trump's talking points. And rightly so, there was a real reluctance on the part of the president and our national security agencies, including mine, and injecting ourselves into an ongoing election campaign. Talking about Trump versus Clinton in the Situation Room was just unheard of and should be unheard of. Uh, but we felt we had to make the decision to make attribution, and we did. Um, so that, and the analogy I used in the Situation Room is, if I'm, I'm a corporate lawyer most of my professional life, if I am the issue of a public stock, and I see that there is a powerful market manipulator out there manipulating the price of my stock during a public offering, I have a duty to tell the investing public what I know. And we did so in, for the intelligence community, uncommonly blunt terms, three paragraphs. I thought we needed to say something about what we knew at the time about election infrastructure, because we were very concerned, I was very concerned about what we saw, but we were not then on October 7th in a position to attribute it to the Russian government. We said it was coming from a Russian platform. Um, and I expected you, you all were, this to you be were big not, news. You were not in a position then because you didn't know or you thought it would be overtly political if you did? We were not then in a position to say with confidence that okay. it was the Russian government publicly. <clears throat> uh, and I thought this was gonna be big news. Uh, I thought we would see uh, a story from David Sanger uh, above the fold in the New York Times with maybe even a full banner headline because this was an unprecedented thing for the United States to accuse another superpower of interfering in our democracy. Uh, but it was below the fold news that day in both the Post and the Times because of the Access Hollywood video. There was, as I'm sure David knows, very little follow-up from the national news media after our statement. And the next 48, 72 hours was all about um, the tape and can he survive? Is he gonna get out? Is he really bringing Bill Clinton's 
ex-girlfriends to the debate, yeah. which was that Sunday, 48 hours later. <clears throat> and it really wasn't until December that the national press came back to this issue. When he's president-elect. And when he's president-elect and said, hey, wow, the Russians interfered in our democracy. And I said, yeah, we, we, we told you that. So. Does that conform uh, to your recollection, as we say? Uh, largely, certainly that day, um, because at, at 3.30, your statement came out. At 4 o'clock, WikiLeaks began dumping John Podesta's emails. And at 4.30, the Access Hollywood tape came out. That was a, that was a busy hour in the newsroom of the New York Times. Uh, and and we've we were, talked about whether all that was just coincidence coinc or right. whether it was yeah. somehow you know, in reaction to... to anyway. Right. Um, a few other just little notes I would, I would make here. We <laughs> ran a story in late July of 2016. Well, first of all, in June of 2016, a private firm announced publicly that they had found Russian malware in the DNC. So we knew it was the Russians. In July, we ran a big front page lead of the paper story that said that the CIA had concluded with confidence that it was the Russian government. We did not say Putin. We didn't say Putin in part because we were trying to protect, uh, as uh, Jay indicated, there were, there were significant source issues out here, and it has since come out that there was a, a unique human source, several human sources, but one in particular they were quite concerned about, not as concerned about uh, okay. anymore. Um, but we had announced that the CIA had concluded that uh, it was the Russians, and I went back and counted later on. We actually wrote about two dozen stories between the June announcement and when we did our big reconstruction of the Russia mm -hmm. hack, which was called The Perfect Weapon, from mm -hmm. which I, I uh, took the title for the, for the book. So it's not as if these weren't written about, but I would certainly agree that it was not the main currency of debate and only became so after the election and has become so more intensely since. Okay, um, for, for externalists, uh, this, is, this is fascinating, but I, <clears throat> we've got a little bit of time and I want to hit a few other things. So you fast forward to now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the intelligence community chiefs were trotted out to the White House podium last week, 10 days ago, whatever it was, to uh, assert again that the um, Russians are at it again. Democracy is in the crosshairs. Right. right. Even, even your successors right. said the country's in the crosshairs. Um, do you have any confidence now that we're any better prepared for what they might do in 2018? So or what they're doing right now. I haven't had access to the intel in 18 months, um, but I listen very closely to what our national security officials say, and I have my own instincts. Uh, <clears throat> Mitch Landrieu said, you don't run the last election. And I used to tell my people, you don't prepare for the last attack. My instincts are that state election officials, with the help of DHS, are somewhat better prepared than they were two years ago. The director of the Illinois board just the other day said it's, he feels that it's like fighting you know, a bolt of lightning with bows and arrows, that the tools he has are right. ridiculous. And my personal view is that the federal government ought to be doing more through grants to support state election officials because their democracy is our democracy. You run federal elections through state election officials. But and yet the Senate has voted down an extra <clears throat> appropriation yeah, for that. Yeah, go figure. So um, I believe we are somewhat better prepared when it comes to election infrastructure cybersecurity. I believe in the briefing we got a couple of weeks ago kind of alluded to this, that the larger threat remains uh, foreign influence on information flow, fake news, extremist views. Uh, this is the most difficult nut to crack because it impinges upon free speech. And I still I believe that even now we do not know the full extent of the Russian influence campaign from 2016. And in that space, the Russians and you know, a lot of domestic actors are taking advantage of our strength as an open society. Okay. Then so I, I, I believe that's the central threat all right. this election Do season. Do you agree with that? Um, first, I would actually say that right now, I think we are once again probably a bit more vulnerable in the electrical grid 
than we are in the election system. Separate subject, but you're Sep right. Separate, yes. right, because mm. our focus has been so much on the electoral. Secondly, midterm elections are a little harder to mess with because yes. while Jay is absolutely correct that there are, we've got all kinds of vulnerabilities of disinformation, it's a little harder for our adversaries to figure out what their best bet is with each of you know, 500 separate races going mm -hmm. on, 435 in the House and another 30 some odd, so I guess 460 something um, uh, in the Senate. And so my, my sense about, about 2018 is that it's the testing ground for techniques that countries, maybe not just Russia, want to use in 2020. <clears throat> just as Ukraine was, as I call it in the book, Putin's Petri dish for the things that they did here in 2016. Everything from election manipulation to disinformation to attacks on the electrical grid. So I'm worried a little bit about 2018, but my guess is that our bigger worry right now is to look at it as places for the Russians and others to test out uh, ideas, systems, and attacks that would come back with a bigger vengeance in two years. Let okay. me just so, so, let me ahead. stress what he just said. Um, 2016, my, my biggest worry at the time was that we were going to see the Russian government basically delete a voter registration list. Uh, and somebody's going to show up to vote, and ma'am, I'm sorry you're not registered. And given the way our politics works, and given the way the Electoral College works, presidential elections are decided in Florida, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and now maybe Michigan and Wisconsin. And it would not be that difficult for a politically astute actor to do something to suppress the vote in key precincts in those key swing states. And it's, that's not necessarily a cyber attack either. And so my biggest concern for 2016 and for 2020 is that our democracy really does dance on the head of a pin. And that's why I'm, I'm hoping that election officials in those states are really focused on this issue. Okay, let's, let's just broaden it. I mean, it seems to me you're, you're I think we understand the, dynamic, the parameters of the problem insofar as it uh, relates to elections. Um, the electoral, electrical grid and other things like that uh, seem to me to be much more important, ultimately. <clears throat> but in both instances, um, the question generally, and you alluded to, it, alluded to it in the beginning of, of what you were saying before, and you develop it in the book. Um, if you, the, the problem is how do you fashion a regime uh, among nations that has the prospect of retarding this kind of activity. You make an analogy to mad mutual assured destruction during the, during the Cold War. Um, but the, the key point I think you make, and I'd like you to elaborate, it on, elaborate on it, and it goes to your reluctance in 2016 to be completely forthcoming, is that there has to be a great deal more transparency the bad guys have to know what we have, we have to know what they have, before you can say, all right, we'll go up to this line and no further, we'll tolerate this, but no more. Am I in the zone of what you're well, concerned close. with? So one of my big arguments in the, in the book is <clears throat> that we have wrapped cyber in way too much secrecy and classification. Not particularly surprising because it's one of the first weapons that emerged from the intelligence community as opposed to, say, from the military. And, you know, it turns out the intelligence agencies are naturally secretive. But secondly, I think there is a sense within the government, um, I would not say this was necessarily true at DHS, but it's certainly within the intelligence agencies, that if you reveal almost anything about your capabilities, that you are telling your adversary too much and they're going to learn too much. Well, I think at this point, after the revelation of Stuxnet and Olympic Games, after the Snowden revelations, after the biggest and worst loss, far worse than Snowden, which was the shadow brokers um, revelations, which uh, fewer people, I think, sort of focused on, also happened in this October 
period, um, summer Ex to October of 2016, that and that was the uh, a group publishing the actual source code of American cyber weapons, some of which were then refashioned and shot against our allies. The WannaCry attack in Britain last year that shut down the <clears throat> British healthcare system for a while was based in part on US weapons. Did the US government ever acknowledge this? No. Had it been that the, somebody had stolen a missile design and shot it back at an American ally, I think there probably would have been public investigations, court martials, and so forth. But because it was cyber, it was relatively easy for the NSA to sort of shut things down. As you'll read in the book, there was great debate within the Obama administration about whether to fire the head of the NSA at the time, the uh, Admiral Michael Rogers. He, in the end, he was not fired. Uh, but I, I play that out at some length. Um, I make this point only because we've gotten to the point where the secrecy, in my view, has actually stepped on our ability to deter. Because we're not making public what could happen to you, and we're not getting into a detailed discussion about what those norms should be. Because we don't want to actually, to do that, you have to think ahead about what we as a country might be willing to give up doing to others. Can you sketch out any set, quickly, any set of norms that you think would work? Or can well, you, Jay? You know, well, the, there, there, I mean, there's one cyber good. norm right now that exists um, that the Chinese government, at least on paper, signed up to in 2015, which is a nation state will not attack the critical infrastructure of another nation state for commercial benefit uh, or, or engage in cyber theft for commercial benefit. And so there are a set of cyber norms that exist right now um, that don't necessarily constitute an act of war, and those need to be further developed. But, mm -hmm. Yeah, and that effort has kind of faltered. It was faltering at the end of the Obama administration, not because of anything the Obama administration did, but because the Chinese started pulling back and the Russians. Mm -hmm. And in the Trump administration, it's gone almost nowhere. Uh, in fact, when John Bolton came in as the uh, national security advisor, he not only got rid of the yeah, Homeland the Security guy. Advisor who was pretty familiar with cyber issues, he eliminated the post of a White House cyber coordinator, somebody who I think Jay probably had to right. go deal with a lot. There was yeah. a very talented uh, NSA official who the uh, Trump administration had appointed early on who had actually run offensive operations at the NSA. And yeah, that's exactly who you want doing your defense, somebody who's been doing offense their whole life, right? right? right. And he was basically <clears throat> sent back to the NSA and never replaced. In fact, the job was eliminated. Now, how you can- I think they hired somebody they yeah. at a much Relatively lower level junior yeah. level military officer that's right, yeah, right. and so uh <clears throat> you know here we have the intelligence community coming out saying no our greatest single but... vulnerability is cyber it's bigger than nuclear proliferation it's bigger than our vulnerabilities for terrorism and we have eliminated the white house cyber coordinator which may explain why it is that we're not making a whole lot of progress on just these issues you're describing can i just make two comments on what yeah. david said meanwhile um, folks um we're going to turn to questions from you so if you want to get so, the microphones while jay is speaking that'd be great david so, makes the point that maybe we should be more transparent about our capabilities as a matter of deterrence i agree that when you're dealing with another nation state Deterrence is the key. You cannot have a 100% effective defense. Deterrence is the key. The reality is that it is, whether you're talking about cyber capabilities or anything else, it is way, way easier to classify something than it is to declassify something in the US government. As Secretary of Homeland Security, as General Counsel of the Department of Defense, I was what we call an original classification authority, an OCI. And in DHS, there were probably about 30 other OCIs. And so if I'm sitting here and I'm writing something, I could decide, you know what? This is top secret and write TS on it here. That's top secret. It's as simple as that. And don't declassify until August 16th, 2048. It's simple as that. Now to declassify that, ahead of that. You have to have a committee, you've got to have discussions, everybody's got to weigh in with their equity, so it is way easier. It's, it's simply the inertia is to over-classify, right. uh, without a doubt. Um, I'm not sure that transparency is the most effective deterrent. 
Um, nations, Kate, nation states can make educated speculation about the capabilities of another superpower. And sometimes it's in our interest that they keep them guessing. Yeah. Keep them guessing. And also, okay. it's not just nation states that can do this. I mean, in nuclear weapons, you need to have uranium, plutonium, and uh, you know, millions of dollars of investment. In cyber, you just need some good laptops, maybe a little stolen malware from the NSA, some good 20-something programmers or younger, and a case of Red Bull, and you're kind of good to go, <laughs> right? Uh, and of, so that means that we Caltech. have so many others uh, you know, in the game. OK. Um, folks, we want you to weigh in. Go ahead, sir. Uh, you indicated that maybe one of the reasons why we didn't retaliate or take that path was because the U.S. open and privatized society uh, is a softer target than some of our adversaries. What would be the top of your lists to harden uh, America, both the electrical and uh, other infrastructure? Well, inevitably, when you're talking about critical infrastructure, it's got to be a public-private partnership. Uh, utilities, financial services, uh, all have their own responsibilities, in my view, for the cybersecurity of their own networks. And in my view, starting point number one has to be further education of those who have access to the systems about the cyber threat because the most devastating attacks by the most sophisticated actors very often start with a simple act of spear phishing. Somebody opened an email that they shouldn't have and opened the attachment to the email that they shouldn't have, and once that happens, the bad actor is in the system and can pose as virtually anyone, the system administrator, uh, David Sanger or Jay Johnson, uh, via email or some other <coughs> method. And so educating those who use the systems about what to do and be suspicious is, is starting point number one. I think that greater information sharing between the USG and private sector uh, is also crucial um, and continued investments in technology. i just add one quick point to that. I agree with everything that Jay said. Part of the problem here is the problem is not static. So if you think about your own house, 10 years ago, you probably had one or two devices connected to the internet, laptop, computer, and uh, you know maybe one other device. And remember, the iPhone only came out 11 years ago. Okay. So what do you have now? You've got probably a few phones. You've got uh, your smart TVs, your Alexa, right? You've got your uh, autonomous car. Maybe you have an internet connected refrigerator. I've never quite figured out what to go do with one of those. Maybe if it told me to stop eating or something, that would be useful. Um, so you've got, so our problem has expanded dramatically. And you have people walking in and out of all of the facilities that Jay just described, financial firms, utilities, with cell phones and, and Fitbits and everything else on, on their person, which yeah. are then connecting mm. into those networks. Yeah. So while we have gotten better at cybersecurity, the problem has worsened dramatically because the target set has so expanded. Okay, yes ma'am. Uh, first, thank you, really, again, amazing panels. I work more in the biological sector and biotechnology where there are these ongoing conversations about dual use issues and the potential of biotechnology to increasingly become usable as an offensive weapon. And global norms are being discussed, but it's all, that's all state state. And you guys have been talking also about state actors and global norms. But in the biotech sector, our concerns are probably even greater with non-state actors, particularly with things like genome editing that makes it even easier for non-state actors to get a hold of technology and use it in an offensive way. Is there a parallel in the cyber world, or is it really more of a state actor kind of problem that you're facing? Well, in, <laughs> we, we, but we're both being deferential here. So, it's been interesting that we have not seen a lot of terror groups make use of cyber as a weapon. ISIS certainly used it as a recruitment tool. And one of the fascinating things was we had several operations run by US Cyber Command that weren't terribly effective 
at shutting it down, as, as uh, Ash Carter, the former Secretary of Defense, has, has written uh, since he left office. Uh, but by and large, cyber attacks require a lot of stability and patience. It takes months to go mount them. So if you're a terror group and you're probably on the run, that can be right. difficult. Mm -hmm. Now, they may get better at that over time. So there are non-state actors almost as sophisticated as nation-state actors. Cyber criminals, those who engage in ransomware, there are nation states that utilize private ingenuity for, for offensive cyber capabilities. And uh, this different range of actors is getting more aggressive, more tenacious, and more ingenious. And my personal view is that we've yet to turn the corner on defense. And then it's gonna get worse before it gets better. And that we have yet to, and there's no effective deterrent for a private actor. You cannot deter a private actor like a nation state. And so... Um, you can indict them, as the U.S. has done in several cases. You can indict them if you can get a hold of them, sure. That's right. And if you can figure out who they are. Exactly. Well, you can indict them, but right. whether you can arrest them is different. Yeah. Right. right. And, and if you can figure out, you can make attribution, and right. you're not mistaken in your attribution. Uh, but I continue to believe that uh, increasing awareness among the public about the dangers of access to the Internet and the dangers of utilizing critical systems. Okay. Yes, sir. So just to follow up on your last conversation here, why don't we have a cyber police, both for nation states, both for uh, commercial uses, for people who have had their identity stolen, their computer hacked, or whatever. There's no place you can report it or anybody to take it. And you can follow up. They give you that number, whoever the person is hacking, you've got a number, but nobody can follow up on it. So how, why, don't we, why don't we do something about this? Well, it's a, it's a great question because the responsibility for who handles cyber attacks, and Jay can speak to this with much more experience than, than uh, I can, is spread out in ways that really make you understand why you need that White House cyber coordinator. So Department of Homeland Security is responsible for domestic <laughs> defense. Unless there's such a big attack, the DOD and the newly empowered U.S. Cyber Command, which now has 6,200 cyber warriors sort of up and running in, in combat roles, or combat ready, as they, as they say, uh, would take over. But for many private companies, the responsibility is their own. And for all of you, the, you know, just as you are expected to have locks on your doors and an alarm system in your house, and you are expected to do some basic things to keep your house protected, you're expected, and the government is not going to do this for you, to do some basic things to protect your own information. That's why people are always telling you to change your password, and you have more of them than you can possibly remember. So, in the Obama administration, we issued a presidential directive called PPD-41 in an attempt to clarify the various roles within the federal government for cybersecurity. And I thought it was a decent job at trying to spell this out. The FBI principally was responsible for threat response, in other words, the crime. DHS, my department, was responsible for asset response, in other words, putting out the fire. And uh, NSA is responsible for its various surveillance activities, and DOD in general is responsible for offensive cyber activities. And so what I'd like to say publicly, domestically, was that Jim Comey is the cop you call to report the crime, and I was the fireman to put out the fire and do the forensics. And I don't know to what extent the current administration has tried to rethink that, but I think it's basically a good model, but I also agree with what David said, that it's incumbent upon the private sector and the public itself to address cybersecurity because the government cannot be everywhere. One additional note on this, President Trump approved on Wednesday uh, a revision to another presidential decision mm -hmm. directive that was signed, it was called PPD-20, which was the one that laid out what the rules are for doing offensive cyber against other countries. Um, when the Obama administration turned out the first one, while they classified the document, at least they turned out some fact sheets that described it, 
And then when Snowden came along, he managed to leak the entire classified document. So we had a pretty good view of, <laughs> of what, the, what the, the, the conditions and responsibilities were. And basically, the Obama administration's position was do the, the minimal amount that you can do uh, without causing collateral damage. We believe that the Trump administration has now gone the other way to loosen the restrictions on doing offensive cyber, which may under some circumstances make sense, but we haven't seen a fact sheet. The document itself is classified, so we're sort of all in the dark. Mr. Secretary. So, speaker's prerogative to ask a question. Um, <laughs> and I'm just going to ask David the same question I asked him last night, not meant to be confrontational. This was a friendly conversation. Um, what are the circumstances, David, at the New York Times under which you will publish classified information and when you will not publish classified That's information? So, you gave part of the answer before, Jay, when you mentioned how much is overclassified, right? I mean, when we got the WikiLeaks documents, we discovered that <clears throat> roughly 15% of them were newspaper articles that were being sent on to the State Department, and that as they put them in the cable system, someone stamped secret on them, mm -hmm. okay? So it does not immediately mean, because something is classified, does not immediately mean by any means that we would not publish it. Um, if something is going to cause Harm to, believed to be, cause harm to a human life, an ongoing operation, intelligence or military <clears> and so <throat> forth. Uh, we may delay publication. We believe. We and believe. It's, you're saying, and, it, and the way saying that, it's your decision. It, it's, the, it's, it's the decision, of, right, because the Supreme Court has ruled there are no prior no, restraints. No. But as Jay will remember, we will try, I'm not sure every news organization does this, but responsible ones do. We will try to come to the administration, describe what we have, what we're getting ready to go publish, and say, if you have issues that we should take on board here, this is the moment to go do it. And usually the Obama administration was pretty good at that. The Bush administration was pretty good at that. In the Trump administration, they tend to be um, pretty non-responsive to that. Um, and you know, there are moments, I mean, think about this. Much of what you have read about the Mueller investigation in recent times, much of what you have read about Russians meeting members of the Trump uh, uh, mm -hmm. campaign was either classified or in the Justice Department's confidential uh, sector at the time that we published them. And I think the very fact that we published a lot of this has been what's driven a lot of the investigation. So there are many moments where I think the justification for publishing something that's either classified or whatever the Justice Department's equivalent of this would be confidential is a pretty sound journalistic decision. We don't want to go into it blindly. What about okay. when it will compromise a very serious national security capability? So um, I'll give you one by example. When in my last book, he uh, can, I can't. Con but, Confront yeah. and Conceal, I uh, had a lot of detail about how the United States got into the Iranian system. Um, and I knew, understood its sensitivity because of the capabilities. Went to the government, said, I want to talk to career people, not political people, about this. Uh, I write a little bit about this in the new book. Um, sat down at some length with Mike Morrell, who at the time was the uh, deputy CIA director. Um, they asked to w that we withhold a small number of things that went to the capabilities. I withheld, I think, just about everything that they asked for. And then, of course, eight months later, Snowden came along and revealed most and of revealed. those capabilities. Okay. But we had no way of knowing that at the time. So if a, if a case can be made that a capability is still you know, useful, um, we usually find a way to word our way around it or make it vague enough. Okay, let me, um, let me um, one quick question because Dwight's been standing here for a while. Putting the, uh, a, thank you, Michael. Putting the public rhetoric aside, how seriously does Congress take this issue? Which issue, I'm sorry? How, how cyber generally? In Congress. How, um, the not enough cyber members of attack. Congress understand the issue, unfortunately. I think that there are a fair number on the armed services committees of both the House and Senate who understand this. There are a handful uh, on the those intelligence committees. committees and, the and there are a handful on the intelligence committees who understand cyber. It's a difficult subject to penetrate, uh, particularly if you're my generation. And there are some good people in Washington who are good teachers. Uh, and I've encountered a, a number 
who are leaders on this issue in Congress who, who I believe okay. understand it well. One, one but quick not answer enough. on that. I agree, there's a small number who are good. We end up talking to the same you know, people mm -hmm. who understand it. There is still something in our political world that makes it acceptable to say, oh, this stuff's so complicated. I go to my grandchildren, they understand it. And this is supposed to be sort of a cute line that politicians well. use. Can you imagine in the 1950s or 60s if somebody said, oh, nuclear weapons, you know, a, nuclear physics is so complex, I go to my grandchildren to understand it. You know, it just would not sell. Yeah, and, but we, and, go to, we go to our kids to understand how to use our iPhones. Right, so, so I mean, there you go. Um, I urge those of you who attend the uh, North Korea panel tomorrow afternoon that David will uh, be a member of to uh, press him if he doesn't come clean on his own. Uh, on the issue of uh, cyber attacks against North Korea and its missiles, you'll recall that time when they were mysteriously falling out of the sky. And I know you have some it's things to say in about the book that. At some length, yeah. um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. This is this is one of these issues that ain't going away. So as long as this organization exists, unfortunately, I bet we're going to be discussing it. Thank you very much, and thank you, Jay and David.